In this episode, Alex Sharfin dives into how he scales podcasts to getting 2.4 million downloads. Plus, he opens up about his biggest mistake in the last 10 years of being an entrepreneur and how he lost over six figures on the poor, poor investment. Plus, he also talks about a financial principle that every marketer needs to hear in this space. And no, it has nothing to do with pre-selling or MVPs and has everything to do with focusing on your delivery first. It's an amazing episode. I actually love everything that Alex has put together. And uh, I think you're really going to enjoy this. And as a result, we ended up moving into this space, paying for build out, being there for 18 months of a five year lease and then buying our way out of it. Listening to the Rich Ad Poor Ad podcast, where we break down the financial principles that rich advertisers are deploying today to turn advertising into profit and get tons of traffic to their websites without killing their cash. These advertisers, agencies, affiliates, brands are responsible for managing over a billion dollars a year in ad spend. You'll hear about what's working for them today, their rich ads, and we'll roast their epic failures and crappy ads on the internet with poor ads. Let's get into it. Welcome to another episode of the Rich Ad Poor Ad Podcast. This is your host, Zach Johnson. I'm with the one and only Dylan Carpenter. You excited for today's guest, Dylan? <laughs> yeah, man, I'm pumped. <laughs> today, I, I, I'm going to be the little schoolgirl today uh, because of today's guest. You got to be the schoolgirl on, on yesterday's uh, guest. Yeah. But um, the reason why I have today's guest on the show is uh, it actually goes back to the early days of Funnel Dash. And it was like right after I left Lead Pages. And at Lead Pages, and everything in my career up until that point was I wanted to be a part of a company that exited and it sold. And at Lead Pages, we had this just ridiculous momentum. We were growing 20% month over month, raised $38 million uh, from VC, and we were one of the fastest growing companies, you know, in the nation. And I felt like a rock star. <laughs> like I was like, you know, the VP of growth and and making all the decisions. And when I left and I started um, my agency and uh, which was the, the early days of, of uh, funnel dash uh, everybody would ask me like hey what did you learn what did you learn there what did you learn what did you learn right because like this was like right before click funnels had kind of entered into the market and the thing I would tell everybody on podcast you probably go like look this up was like momentum is the most underrated thing in entrepreneurship and the most difficult and like elusive thing to achieve. And I understood then kind of just sitting in the, what I call sitting in the shit of like a startup for like the first like 12 months where you're just trying to get momentum. It is so painful. And I was like, I completely understand now why like when people ultimately get those offers to sell their companies and they don't want to take it no matter what the number is because they work so damn hard to get momentum. And the reason why uh, I've got today's guest on is because this is like the first guy in, since then <laughs> that I've seen break down on a how to systematically get momentum into your life, into your career, into your business. And I thought it was just like an elusive thing. I was like, well, you, if you got it, you got it. And like, once you have it, like hold on to it forever. <laughs> and so... And so, yeah, I'm, I'm pumped. He's got an amazing podcast. He's the, uh, the host of the momentum podcast. That's literally like w what it's called. And, um, he's also the creator of the billionaire code and, uh, the entrepreneur personality type, which I think we'll dive into a little bit. Um, and I think something new that he's up to that's, that's super relevant that I, I was literally just taking notes on like this week. I didn't even tell him this, but like the customer centric mission statement, uh, he's the creator of, and you guys will hopefully get a little teaser of that, but, um, I've just totally apparently screwed that up for several years with funnel dash. So <laughs> anyways, I'm excited. I'm so sorry for the, for the long intro, but Alex Sharfin, welcome to the show, man. Zach, so good to be here, man. Thank you for that personal intro. I appreciate it. Yes. Yes. So did I do it justice, man? Like for, for those that like, haven't had that same level of experience in you know, my own life, like maybe give everybody a little bit about what you're up to and, and why you're up to it uh, with what you're doing. Yeah, you got it, Zach. Um, you know, I, I, the company I run, we help 
visionary entrepreneurs grow and scale their businesses. And we work, we work with the specific visionaries, the ones who can't turn it off, the ones who want to make a contribution just as much as they want to make a living, the ones who are driven to do things every day to move the world forward. And we, we provide the systems, the tools, really the process, the structure, the routine that gets you into momentum and locks you in and stays there. And what we found is that most visionary entrepreneurs have a really hard time getting help. You know, it's, it's almost like the condition of being a visionary. We need far more help than the average person to get to where we want to go. But anytime we have to request help or support of any kind, it leaves us feeling vulnerable and exposed. We bridge that gap with structure and with systems. And the change we want to make in the world is that visionary, visionary entrepreneurs get the help they need and go out and change the world. And we'll know we're successful when visionaries around the world are using our systems to be the change they want to see in the world and make their greatest contribution. I feel like the word visionary, I know there was a lot said there, but the thing that really speaks to me is when you use the word visionary entrepreneurs, I identify with that so much because I'm surrounded by a lot of entrepreneurs that don't really care to be visionary. They just like want to make a profit. They want their lifestyle. They want their Lambo and they don't give a shit about their customers. Yeah. Right. And like, I do very well with those entrepreneurs. I, I don't either. You know, like, you know, like what, like I, I feel like over at, at Funnel Dash, it's the most rewarding thing when people are like, oh, dude, ad card is a game changer, right? Like you're changing an industry. Like, I can't believe that you offer free ad copy and creative just for using like a credit card, right? That's like, oh my gosh, like I'm, a, I, I'm officially a visionary and I feel significant. And, and you're like, uh, you know, you're one of the first people that like put a whole language around that and a whole theme around that with your, um, with your content. So yeah, I, I, I'm pumped to, to, to get into it. And, uh, you know, the first, the, the first part, like I want to get right into like, what's working now for you? Like, what's this, what's tell us about this rich ad that's, that's working for your own uh, business these days. You got it, Zach. So <clears throat> we're in a unique position as a company. You know, if, if you look at what we do, we work with business owners most of the time who are already up and running. Occasionally we get a startup entrepreneur, usually somebody who's already been there and done something, but starting up something new. But most of the time we're working with somebody who's in the multi six figures up to tens of millions of dollars. We have three different coaching programs. The first one is usually the multi six figure. The second one's usually people who are around a million to three million. The third one, we have members anywhere from three to 50 million. And here's why that puts us in a unique situation. We're not dealing with business opportunity. We're not dealing with um, like impulse buys and we're not dealing with an unsophisticated consumer. In fact, when you look at the average member that we have, they've already been through three or four coaching programs, not one or two. Everybody's been for one or two. They've usually been through several different experiences. And when we talk to people coming towards us, most of the time they've had significant negative experiences with people over promising, under delivering, and them not really getting what they want. I think that's kind of, unfortunately, it's a theme today in the online marketing world over promising and under delivering. In fact, <laughs> it feels like the curriculum for a lot of online marketing products, but you know, <laughs> unfortunately, um, but sell it before you build it. Right. Right. And you only have to be one week ahead of your clients. Every time somebody says that I want to rush the stage, like, like a football player and just wipe them out at the knees. <laughs> um, it's just such an unfair thing to say, you know, like you can have yeah. no expertise, no, nothing. You don't even have to be able to talk. You can be an expert. Come on, dude. Come um, <laughs> And the problem is, is that a lot of our members have been through that stuff. So, so for us, you know, when, when we were, when I was asked about coming on this show and I was you know, told what is our most successful ad to, to me, it's our podcast. You know, if I had to look at where do we get the most um, mm -hmm. qualified leads, where do we get the most prepared leads to come from to us? It's the podcast. Here's why. Let's get real about the marketing space today. Everybody has the BS troubling backstory, the story of overcoming everything, the reason why they're the best in what they do, and they have the perfect little package that they put out there for you. And that's how most people market. That's how most people market from the ad beyond. The difference with us is with what we help people do and with the consumer that we're addressing, they've already been there. They've done that. They know these strategies. We're not going to manipulate them, pressure them, or persuade them into doing something. They actually have to learn enough about us to trust us. So the way that my team and I approach our podcast is we put our absolute best content on the podcast. Um, you know, I've, we've had, I mean, I, dozens is an underestimation. We've had hundreds of people reach out to us and say, I just hit six figures. 
I learned everything on your podcast. You know, uh, I was struggling for years, just hit a million dollars. I did it with these eight episodes of the podcast. I listened to the Billionaire Codes episodes. This is what we did with our company. And so when we hear from people that have made measurable tactical changes and strategic changes in their business and they're succeeding, we know the podcast is working because the goal is that every single episode can make a massive impact in an entrepreneur's business. And so it's not, it's not to make noise, it's to build trust. And so the whole point of every episode I do, I think to myself, here's who I'm talking to. I'm building trust with them. I'm going to leave them better off than when they started this podcast. And then I hit record. And as a result, uh, this morning, I think we had 2.4 million downloads um, cumulatively, which is really awesome. Even wow. better, um, in all of the United States business reach, we're number 58. And in, this is my favorite statistics statistic. Out of all 800,000 podcasts in the entire world, we're in the top 1,000. And so you look at those types of numbers, and it's just like, you know, that's that's by far the best thing that we're doing. Have you even marketed the podcast? Like, Hey, he's just like, cause it's for most of them are just you talking, right? Like I yeah. don't, I, I haven't even, I don't think I've seen a single guest on there. Or from the one we bring on a, bring on a member when something really extraordinary brings on or happens with a member, we'll bring them on to share just that specific story. But, um, and we market a little bit, you know, we, um, we've run some ads to it, not a lot, but most of it has been other people who have listened to the podcast share it with their list because it, because they genuinely, genuinely feel like it's, it's helping people, you know, um, within the first year that we were out there, I would say, I don't know, it was probably shared with a half million people just through other people's lists based on listening to an episode yeah. and then somebody taking the episode and sharing it with everybody they know. That is amazing. Yeah. That's so rewarding too. People are like sharing your stuff around. I love it. Well, what's even more rewarding is when we get the the messages, like some come through Facebook, sometimes they'll come through Instagram. Sometimes they'll send it to our support email. And there we get like not short messages about how it's changed somebody's life. And those are some of the most emotional, amazing things in the world to read. You've been at it for two years though. Like I was just looking at it before, like as you were talking, I'll pull it up on my phone. You got like 300 reviews You did, and you did it. Has it been two years or I think it's actually been four years now. So oh, you've been doing four. Oh, okay. So on yeah. Apple, it says 2018 to 2020, but you've here's been why doing- on Apple, you can only have 300 episodes. So we actually have three podcasts. We have momentum okay. podcast archive one momentum podcast archive two, and then the current show. Oh, <laughs> oh man. So you knew it for four years. So yeah. What was it like in the first like year? What was it? Was it oh, like yeah, it- you can go listen, it was shaky. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny. Like one of the, uh, here's what's funny. I, I get a lot of really positive feedback from the first 50 episodes right. because it was basically my origin story and kind of laying out the argument for the entrepreneurial personality type. You know, the first, first, 10 or 15 episodes are basically the entrepreneurial personality type book. Um, yeah. But when I go back and listen to them, you know, I, I, my Russell Brunson encouraged me to do a podcast. He's like, I said, who do I interview? He's like, dude, you should never interview anybody. You should just talk. You know enough that you don't need other people on your show. So you go listen to the first few episodes and it really, it's, it's like, uh, you know, I, I listen to it. And I'm like, man, my voice is kind of shaking. I'm not really confident in what I was doing. I think I didn't really like dial it in until probably up episode 20. But here's what's funny. There's reviews on, if you go read the reviews on Apple, there's actually reviews that say, don't, don't be scared off by the first 10 episodes. They're a little <laughs> shaky, but they've got great content and keep listening. It gets so much better. And so, you know, I, I share that because I think that these days, entrepreneurs don't want to hit go until everything's perfect. Screw that, man. Just get it out there. One of the things my old mentor used to say is focus on one funnel one target audience, one offer, uh, with one, um, mechanism or conversion mechanism for one year. Like that was like his rule and he's like the second you start adding one variable to any of that, just the complexities just get so ridiculous. And what we see so much in this space is people trying that for one month. <laughs> yeah. And so I just wanted to hear this, 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 this the arc of, of the podcast, right? You've been doing it for four years, man. Like that's like you put in your time, right? I, I'm starting to see people that, you know, hit this like two, three year mark and their, their commitment to their marketing and their content and their publication. And it really starts to, it, it really starts to pay off. But was that for you like in the first six months or 12 months of it? Or did you, did you just crush it from the get go? 
Kind of, kind of, Zach. I mean, at the beginning, we definitely got some attention just because I would go out and speak and I'd be in front of an audience of 5,000 people. And then I would always share the podcast and the URL. And sometimes I would read the manifesto, which got people pumped up. In fact, okay. one time I read it at, at, at Funnel Hacking Live. I, at the beginning, I'm like, does anybody mind if I do the manifesto? And everybody went crazy. About halfway through, the audience was doing it. I wasn't doing it. I was like holding wow. the microphone up to the audience. Everybody was yelling. I'm like, holy crap, everybody knows the manifesto. So it, 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 at uh, the beginning, it definitely wasn't like a huge rush of leads, but here's what it was. When people called us, they're like, I just listened to podcast 17. I need to talk to you guys. I need that help. Or, you know, I just wow. listened to your podcast on um, overcoming challenges with your team. And I've had that issue, or I just listened to the podcast on, um, you know, vulnerability with your team creates momentum. And I have a really hard time with that. I want to know how to do it. And so by I love it. really solid content out there, people would call and they would almost order from us. Now, yeah. here's, here's what happens now. Um, we have people who get on our call and, and, you know, one of our, we don't have salespeople. We have coaches. I don't like any type of high pressure persuasion in our sales process. I want it to just be consultative, but we'll have our coaches. One of our coaches will get on a call and they'll say, you know, that somebody will describe the problem and they'll say, Oh, it sounds like you're in transactional management. And then the person will say, yes, transactional management. I want to get to transformational leadership. I listened to the podcast on it. It sounds great. And so like they take over the sales call. Wow. And so we know we're reaching our members because a lot of the time they jump on a call with us and they're convincing us they need to work with us. Damn. That is so legit. That is so legit. Yeah. I love that, dude. All right, so I want to hear. Uh, I want to know you're not perfect, um, <laughs> <laughs> dude. It's so not perfect. <laughs> no, a failure. I want to hear about this poor ad. I know we're gonna we're gonna deviate from. Let me just cue this up here. We're gonna deviate from the normal <laughs> poor ad segment here because uh, this is such an epic failure story. We couldn't resist. Um, but I think a lot of people are paying for it right now. And so, what's uh, what's your what's your poor ad story? share kind of the origin of this. So when, when I agreed to be on this podcast, I was told, you know, you need to share a success and a failure. And, and nobody said like, my, my assistant didn't say it just has to be an ad failure. And I'm like, well, I, I actually think that there's a lot of nobility in sharing failure. I actually yeah. think there's a lot of grace in sharing failure. Because Today, especially in the online marketing world, I'm, I'm extraordinarily challenged by all these entrepreneurs with perfect backstories and, you know, the one mistake they made that got them to the place where they are now and nothing ever is any wrong with them. And, you know, I, I think I think one of the, the biggest disservices we do to the entrepreneurial space is sharing only our successes and not the challenges we've created because we've all had them. You know, whenever an entrepreneur, whenever I hear an entrepreneur's backstory and they're perfect, I'm like, OK, well, stay the hell away from me because you're about to crash big time. <laughs> if you really are perfect and you've never had a problem, man, the world is going to open up and swallow your ass because that's just not how it works as an entrepreneur. And so for me, I, you know, I, I, I would rather share the most colossal failures I've had so that people can understand how to avoid those things. Yeah. You know, I'm 47 years old. I'm independently wealthy. I've made tens of millions of dollars for my family, hundreds of millions of dollars for my members. I've also screwed stuff up royally. And in just the past few years, I think it was about five years ago, Katie and I, um, well, actually, 
I persuaded Katie, my wife, that we needed to get this office space because the office space was going to be this, this draw and we were going to bring people to Austin and we were going to do big events in the space and it was going to be so cool. It's like this entrepreneurial hangout. And it was all of those things. Yeah. But I got emotional in that decision. You know, I, I didn't run projections. I, I did some. I ran the projections to confirm my opinions. I didn't run the projections to say, like, is this real? Um, I didn't do enough. Like, I didn't really sit down and do enough searching of like, hey, are we going to be able to fill this space? Is it going to work for us? Is it something we really need? And as a result, we ended up moving into this space, paying for build out, being there for 18 months of a five-year lease, and then buying our way out of it. And I see so many entrepreneurs right now today making this exact mistake. Uh, and I made it. And, and here's, you know, I, and, and the reality is. Wait, wait, I just want to know how, 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 like, how does that work? When you're on a five-year lease and you're 18 months in, just like how many years did you have to buy out? Or like months? Oh, Zach, so here's what most people don't understand about office leases. So I've, 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 I've been, been in business since I was in my teens, but I think the first office lease I ever signed was at 19. And since then, I've probably signed 70 of them. I used to have offices throughout Latin America. I've had several offices here in the US. Um, the, the business that I had in my 20s, we had, we had an office in Mexico, Argentina, Paraguay, um, Brazil. And so I've, I've signed offices internationally and nationally. What most people don't know is about 20 to 25% of office leases don't work out and there's a negotiation at the end. They don't actually finish because you're done. They finish because you bought your way out. In fact, I think Pinterest just bought their way out of their, their office in San Francisco for like $100 million, which shows you just how bad that office space was hurting them. And so what we did in that case, um, I think we had about a $30,000 a month lease. And we ended up, um, actually, you know what we did in that case? We have a really good asset protection structure. We did not have a personal guarantee on that space. We went to the landlord and said, hey, this business isn't working out. We don't have a personal guarantee. There's nothing to come after here. We want to let you know that in the next two months, we're going to be winding down operations and we're going to turn the keys back over to you. And so we we shut down the company and we walked away. Yeah. Oh, dude, that's smart. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's, a, it's a, that easy to get no personal guarantee, but when you've been doing this for a while, you can you can do those things. And yeah. so we we already had it built into the lease, how we exited. You know, they kept our security deposit and we moved on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Still, you know, 18 months down the drain, still, still lost for sure. Don't get me wrong. But like, you still, you still were able to, you know, hedge your losses there it a little bit. It was a several hundred thousand dollar loss. Like, let's get real. Between build out and, yeah, yeah. Right. and, and the, the part that we did furnish and the lease that we paid for that we didn't need to, I mean, it was a yeah. several hundred thousand dollar loss. That's why when I, when, when, you know, I was told I was going to be on this podcast and I needed the biggest failure, I'm like, well, that's easy. In the last 10 years, that's probably it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's only because I was bankrupt in 2007, and that's 13 years ago, not 10. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's crazy. I uh, I am curious. Yeah, I, we could we could go down a whole segment on offices here. All right, let's start with this next segment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you know, part of the show is we're, 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 our enemy is marketing math, and uh, yeah. we're, we're we're trying to really educate the, the marketers on, you know, some financial principles, cash management strategies, really how to incorporate this into their advertising, into their marketing. And uh, just because they got two, 300% ROAS on 100K a month spend doesn't mean they should drain the bank and go <laughs> go crazy in Q4. <laughs> so what, uh, what comes to mind, you know, for, for, uh, for you when we share this, and, and particularly as you think about you know, our audience is, they're, they're just addicts to Facebook ads. They're, they're agencies that are, um, you know, one client away sometimes from just like being negative cash flow, And, uh, and they're all, um, just trying to unlock that one ad and that one funnel and, and, and just go for it. Right. And so they'll spend a million dollars in testing and then they'll spend like another million in ads just to get that that million dollar two comma combo award. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. So. I think there's a lot of people who have a temp two comma club award with negative return on investment. And, and there I, you go. I, mean that like, I don't mean that to rip on Russell, but I think no. there's a lot of marketers out there who probably spent more than a million dollars to get that award. And, yeah. and I, and I, I don't think it's one or two, you know? <laughs> and, and so for me, when I look at the, the world of internet marketing math, you know, 
guys, this is a space I've played in for, for about 15 years. And I've seen it all. I've, I've seen the guys who stand in front of the room and talk about all their gross numbers. And I'm the guy who sits in the audience and goes, Hey, can we talk about net for a minute? And they get really mad. And, you know, I, I think when I look at marketing, I, I've been in marketing my entire career. I'm not a marketer, but I've been in marketing my entire career. And I make that distinction. Cause I think these days marketers are like the people who make up stories and, and like, I don't know. It's, it's like marketer has become a position in the entrepreneurial world. So are you an entrepreneur? No, I'm a marketer. What does that even mean? In, in, in a lot of cases, it means I make What does stuff. it mean? Right. It's like, <laughs> in a lot of cases, it means all I do is market. I sell stuff. I don't really care about delivery. I don't care about product fulfillment. I don't care about customers. I just market. And I think that's one of the biggest issues that we have in the, the space today. And, and so I'll share two things with you. One is I have this, this sincere belief, marketing is measurement, period. That's it. There's nothing else to it. If you're if you have emotions involved in marketing, if you're if you're looking at it and you're thinking, oh, this is going to be cool, or this is going to like this is the right word because it makes me feel good. Well, unless it measured to be the right word, then marketing is 100% measurement. This is the most non-emotional, data-driven part of your business. And I think today, one of the biggest issues is that most people aren't treating it that way. Mm -hmm. So first and foremost, that's important, and it's important for for all of us who are in marketing to understand that if we don't know the numbers behind what we're doing, if we don't have the metrics, the data, the understanding of what we're doing by spending money and having money come in, we should stop. And I think that's that's like the key is to know that that marketing is measurement, and if you treat it any other way, you're going to be in trouble. And in our membership, we have a ton. You know, most of the people who are in our membership are in the online space. They're entrepreneurs who deliver a high level expert product or service. They do it in a very integral way where they get huge results with their clients. And we also work with a lot of agencies. We work with a lot of companies that help other people do the same thing. And the other thing that, that I think is crucial for all of us is to understand that most of what you hear people talk about, unless you can get them to verify it, probably has a little more to it. I can't stand internet marketer math. And I think it's setting up these belief systems in the market where if you're not successful within 90 days, you're a failure. If you don't have a million dollar business at the end of the year, you didn't do it right. You know, and, and I literally hear people say that it's like, Alex, I'm 90 days in and I still haven't made six figures. Like, dude, in any other century, that would be the weirdest thing to say. But only today, because we have these armies of marketers out there saying million dollars in 90 days, you know, watch me do it faster than anybody else. Watch me do it with no effort while I binge watch Netflix. I actually saw that on a sales letter. Like, no. watch me, it, the sales letter was like, watch me make a million dollars in the next 90 days while I binge watch Netflix. Come on. If you're doing that, you're probably going to, you should end up in jail most likely because you're doing something wrong. It's not how it works. And so I think, you know, in the, in the marketing space today, the, the, I think the thing that's been taken out of the marketing equation is that integrity actually matters. And, and you should like, if you're going to make a promise, deliver on the promise. Here's what I, here's how I feel. The most important marketing is your delivery. And I don't think most people look at it that way. You know, I, I built a, a business that was on the Inc 500 list three times. And we did 9 million, 12 million and 13 million at over 45% margin. People ask me all the time, how did you do that? We did it because delivery was our marketing. Delivery was the biggest driver of business for us. In our second year of business, over half of the business came from the referrals. And when you're in that space where you're getting referrals, where your members are talking about you, where you're getting notoriety for the success of the people you're working with, that's the best marketing. Mm -hmm. Oh, geez. Uh, let's keep going, man. Just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Zach, this is this hits very close to home, you know. Um, recently we had some of our stuff ripped off. There's this guy named Dan Locke. I don't know if you've heard of him. <laughs> oh yeah. We I love this is great. You know who he is? <laughs> no, oh, I've seen your post on it. I've uh I I know who he is. He's ripped off everybody. <laughs> oh, I mean, he like this is a business model at Dan Locke and Company. So, yeah, yeah. you know, he he I think he's one of the many entrepreneurs out there who basically surf the internet looking for other people's stuff that they can rip off and modify slightly and put into their own marketing. And if I modify slightly, we mean slightly. Slightly, <laughs> like so slightly that you could mistake it for the same thing. And so uh, uh, somebody we know actually sent us a download that Dan had put on his website where he used almost an identical knockoff of our billionaire code content and, yeah. and, and had it in one of his brochures for his high ticket program. Now, 
I have, I have a challenge with anybody just copying somebody's content, especially mine. That's, that's super challenging. But here's what's even more challenging. Dan Locke doesn't have a clue how to teach my content. And, you know, if you look at that guy's background, which I have now that he ripped us off, I'm like, who is this person? What's going on? Like, what, how did this happen? Well, basically four or five years ago, he was teaching hair studios how to grow and he's never owned a hair studio. Overnight, he became like this, um, like, uh, like sensei, uh, <laughs> <laughs> martial arts expert, marketing expert, business expert, all this stuff. And if you watch any of his videos and you've ever been in business and you listen to his advice, it's dubious at best. I mean, there's some of the weirdest advice I've ever heard. I got a little into this after he took our stuff. And but he, so here's the biggest challenge that I have is that the, the content that he took, took our company and the, the businesses that I've owned and the teams that I've had about 20 years to put together. It's the basis for all three of our coaching programs. It's actually the basis for every coaching conversation we have. And it's the outline, the matrix of all the content that we share with our members. And so we're now in a world where somebody takes something that foundational, but also that in depth, throws it up on a page and says, hey, I can do this too. Mm. And it's interesting. You know, we, I actually went out publicly and said, hey, this was taken from us. There wasn't enough that was duplicated as it, you know, exactly that we could say this is a copyright violation. Like people like Dan know what they're doing. They do just enough. So they're in the gray area of the law. And mm -hmm. his lawyer ended up sending us a letter saying that he was going to sue us, that if I didn't stop talking about it, are you listening, Dan? If I didn't <laughs> stop talking about it, he was going to sue us. I'm still waiting for the paperwork um, and said that not only did, did he not copy us, he created all the content on his own. So I have not stopped talking about it. I've continued to, like I said, I'm just waiting for a process server to come and get me. Um, <laughs> and overnight, or just all of a sudden, a few weeks ago, or I think a week or two ago, he changed all of the content to something different. And here's, here's what, this is what, the reason I share this story is that I think that this is a significant percentage of the marketing that's done today. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's a significant percentage of the online marketing products that are out there today is products where I call it the 90-10 rule. 90% 90 of the effort and energy and focus goes into acquiring the customer, 10% goes into keeping them. Mm -hmm. And it's it's if you've ever been in a product like that, you know it and you know how challenging it is. Oh, that's so rough. Man, that's so yeah, rough. definitely in the marketing realm, the amount of things that get ripped off from strategies to case studies, it's just unreal. So were you more irritated or flattered? I, kind of, I always, I always see people posting like, "Hey, or were you irate?" <laughs> yeah, I well, I'm never flattered. I'm never flattered. No, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm irritated. But you know what? I also here, here's, here's what really gets me. I know how hard it is for an entrepreneur to ask for help. Let's get real. I mean, let's, let's be very real about the entrepreneurial personality type. We need more help than the average person, but anytime we have to ask for help, it leaves us feeling vulnerable and exposed. And I've worked with a lot of entrepreneurs up close and personal, and here's what I know about asking for help. It brings up childhood issues. It brings up memories of school. It brings up memories of neglect. It brings up times where we weren't helped, where we felt exposed, where we didn't get the support we need. It is incredibly difficult for us as entrepreneurs. And the day that an entrepreneur finally crosses the chasm and says, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to admit I need help. I'm going to step into vulnerability. I'm going to buy this product. I'm going to join this membership. I'm going to get the help I need. That is a sacred time. That is a sacred space. That is an incredible step that entrepreneur is taking. And anytime that happens, I want to like congratulate that entrepreneur, pat him on the back. Like, let it say, you know, I, I've got your back. This, this is what you need to do. This is what you should be doing. And the challenge today is that entrepreneurs are raising their hand, stepping into vulnerability and getting into a program like Dan Locks, where they're going to be in a buzzsaw and nothing works. And the, the testimonials are online about how terrible his stuff is. And there's a reason he doesn't create it himself. And so he, they're going to get shredded in that program. And that's what really bothers me. And what bothers me even further is that, you know, guys like, like him and others put 90% of their effort on marketing. So they have huge YouTube followings and Instagram followings and... <laughs> You got to be suspect of anybody who describes themselves as a YouTube celebrity on their Facebook page. <laughs> I was actually in the inner circle with Dan Locke and I met him one time in one of Russell's groups. I didn't meet him. He was like 10 feet away from me. And during the entire meeting, I couldn't get within five feet of him. Energetically, the guy just repelled me. He had like a Gucci shirt on and it was too tight. And his, he had like weird velvet loafers. And it was, it was like somebody showed up trying to look like they had a whole bunch of money, but everything didn't quite fit together. And 
I remember looking him up in that meeting and I put a post on, post on Facebook that said, cause I, I like, it came up in my memories and I'm like, oh my gosh, that was about Dan Locke. The post was, if you have to describe yourself as a celebrity, you probably just proved the opposite. And so it was about him. And, <laughs> and it, it was so funny. They came up within a few weeks of him taking our stuff. I'm like, huh, I have a history with him. I, I didn't uh, a few so years fun. ago when I met him. And, but I think that that's, that's, that's one of the, that's one of the big, the big issues for people out there is that they don't know who they can trust. Yeah. I was, we were talking before the show about, um, uh, Landon in my entreport days, he always he used to in the SaaS world, right? Everybody uses the word MVP, right? Like in the info world, we say you have pre-sell. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, you're a masterclass now. It's your master. Oh, it's, it's, so you're going to pre-sell your masterclass. And in, uh, in SaaS, it's, <clears throat> it's MVP. Minimum viable and, product. Yeah. And, and, and SaaS world is, a, is, is the same in, in the sense that like, we've taken it too far in the sense of your MVP, like can't, you know, shouldn't be shit. Right. It shouldn't right. like it have, I think the best way you described it is it shouldn't have like that long, that length of, from time of implementation to time of value. Yeah. Uh, in this. Yeah. So I, um, and I that, couldn't agree I mean, more. It's, it's sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, oh, okay, it, it's a good point you make because in the SAS world, first of all, today, there are so many new software as a service that if you're doing anything in your business and you want to go compare them, it might be 15 different products that are out there. And mm -hmm. the biggest challenge that I see in the, the SaaS world today is that a lot of people have put out their minimum viable product and then just go focus on the marketing. And they forget that the minimum viable product was step one. <laughs> it's only the thing you launch with and then you're immediately supposed to start enhancing it. But you see a lot of people out there who, who again, focus on the marketing, keep that minimum viable product out there, and then it never really improves. And here's the issue with software as a service for anybody that's listening, especially if you're new to entrepreneurship. W. Edwards Deming, or not, no, it wasn't Deming, sorry, it was Drucker. Drucker, uh, Peter Drucker, one of the most amazing business minds in history, wrote 36 books on business. I have them all right there. Um, one of my personal heroes used to, he, he had this saying that you should consider a decision with the, uh, consider, consider the importance of a decision based on the time it will take to undo it. So if you've got a decision in front of you and you can like say yes, and then the next day say no, and it's no big deal, then it's not that big of a deal of a decision. Don't be that, you know, you don't have to be that worried about making the decision. If um, you've got a decision in front of you where it's like, we're going to install this new software platform, slow down. Yeah. Slow down. Way too many people are like, they see the page, they impulse buy, they sign up, they get it into their business. And here's what we don't realize. The cost of a software as a service is not the $19.99 or the $99 a month you're going to spend on it. That doesn't really matter. The cost is the time, the effort, the, the, the installation time, the, uh, the onboarding time, the time that it actually provides value back to you. And unfortunately, in the SaaS world today, there is a lot of products where the people who have introduced them haven't gone through that value equation themselves. I'm convinced of it because you see too much of it today. <sighs> Alex, just talk about whatever you want now, man. It's just <laughs> <laughs> uh, this has been amazing. I, I, I could keep this thing on a roll here, but yeah, man, tell everybody a little bit about what you've got going on next, how we can support you. And, um, and how folks can get in touch. This has been like absolutely amazing. That'd be awesome, Zach. So um, the best best place to hear more of my stuff is the Momentum Podcast, like you mentioned earlier. You can look it up on iTunes. You can go to my website. We have a podcast page where you can search through an index, or you can go to MomentumPodcast.com, and we have links to all the popular players there. Um, and then we have a really cool promotion coming up next week. So if, if this podcast is out by October 6th, I hope people will be able to check it out. Will it be? Yeah. Well, we'll put you at the front of the line. Heck we'll, yeah. we'll, All right. We'll get it out there. <laughs> so, so next week, October 6th, 7th, and 8th, I'm actually doing three days of free training. And this goes more into the whole building trust and, and having people understand who we are and having them come towards us rather than having to persuade them to work with us. And so October 6th, 7th, and 8th, uh, at 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Central, I'm going to be training for about an hour to 90 minutes and then answering any questions anyone has. And we're calling this Momentum Masterclass, even though we made fun of Masterclasses earlier. <laughs> it's Momentum Masterclass, but here's the deal. This is not new content. 
This is actually content that we're reshooting that's going to go behind our paywall for our membership. And it's foundational content that will help an entrepreneur no matter where they are in business. And so if you go to MomentumMasterclass.com, you can sign up. We'll send you some reminders and we can spend some time together next week. Here's the only warning. If you're considering it, um, it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 10 and 2 p.m. And we're going to leave the recording up until midnight. Then we're taking it down. Um, we, we're a company that deals with a lot of, uh, not deals with, we're a company that believes in integ integral marketing. And so if we're going to put something behind a paywall, we're not going to leave it out there forever. And so people are going to have about, you know, a little over uh, around eight or nine hours to consume it. Then we're taking it down. Then I'm doing it again the next day. And so we're really excited about that. And one of the things you're going to talk about there that, that, that uh, I was kind of digging into was your client centric mission. Yeah. You know, that could be a whole podcast all on its own, but like, could you just like break that down for a little bit? Cause I feel like I would just feel like a failure if I didn't have you talk about it on this. Podcast. For sure. Yeah. So I, I, here, here's, here's what the client centric mission is. You know, I, I've, I've been in business. I've been in, I've been in consulting and coaching of some kind for most of my career. There was a period that we were in real estate where I did a lot of coaching and consulting, but it wasn't my main business. But throughout my entire career, what I've really focused on is helping businesses grow. And there is a issue with how we create mission and vision statements. You, it, it, we're doing it wrong. They, when you read most vision, mission or vision statements, they don't motivate anyone, not the team, not the customers, no one. They're, they're, it's something like, you know, the, the Bob Smith team of realtors endeavors to be the number one real estate in the Orlando area, real estate team in the Orlando area. Uh, serving their customers at the highest level and um, finding people happy homes and blah, blah. And it's like, blah, 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 blah. You know, I remember three or four years ago, I was at a friend of mine's office here in Austin and he was having some trouble getting his team to focus and all go in the same direction. And I'm like, so dude, do you have a mission statement? Can I, can I see it? And he's like, yes. And he got up and walked away. And I'm like, what just happened? <laughs> and he walks back in and he's got a frame and he hands me a frame and I'm holding this big frame. And I'm like, Sanjay, what is this? And he goes, that's our mission statement. I just got it out of the lobby. I'm like, do you use it? He's like, not really. It was in the lobby. He's like, we had, a, we had a consulting come in a few years ago. He showed us how to put that together. We put it in the lobby. We haven't really talked about it since. And that's how most mission statements are. And the yeah. issue is, is that a lot of this belief and, and understanding a mission statement comes out of a book called Good to Great by Jim Collins. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a fan of that book. It's got some great <laughs> business strategies in it. It's kind of a dry book too. Let's it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's got some decent business strategies in it. I'm a huge fan of how much Jim Collins has sold of that book because man, he's an amazing <laughs> book marketer. I don't think most entrepreneurs really get that much out of that book. I mean, there's, there's having the right people on the bus and all that stuff. Like the platitudes are decent. But the strategy that he infuses in that book and the examples he uses are very challenging for me because I worked with some of those companies on the inside. I was a consultant. And the way he rolls out his stories is not the way that it really was. And so, and, and here's the, the issue that, that is in that book is that Collins did most of his research and most of his writing based on data. He never was really roll up your sleeves and go get it done. And when you look at how businesses really grow, they grow when they focus on a population that they serve. They grow when they focus on their, their clients, their members, the people who they're making a difference for. And if that's not in your client centric mission, if that's not in your mission statement, you're dead. And 99% of the mission statements I see avoid talking about the customer. And so the way that we have people create mission statements is simple. It's a four part framework. It's who are you going to help? How are you going to help them? What's the change you're going to make? And how will you know you're successful? At the beginning of this podcast, you asked me, Alex, can you fill everybody in on a little bit of what you do? I answered four questions. Who I help, how I help them, change I'm going to make, and how I know I'm successful. You can rewrite the podcast and hear it. It sounds something like this for our company. We help visionary entrepreneurs who can't turn it off, and we help them by giving them the systems, the process, the structure and routine they need so that they can get the help the need, they need and grow their business. And, the, and we will know we're successful when visionary entrepreneurs around the world are using our systems to grow their businesses and build empires and make their greatest contribution. And when I, all I do is think about those four questions in my head. And if I'm at a cocktail party, I answer it one way. If I'm on stage, I might answer it with, you know, a little more embellishment. I can, I can answer those four questions over the course of 30 seconds or 30 minutes if I need to, but it's, it's just those four. Who are you going to help? 
How are you going to help them? What's the change you're going to make? And how will you know you're successful? And that's the framework we use with 100% of our members. And, and here's, here's why it is so effective. You can use it with a new client. You can use it with a new team member. You can use it when somebody says, what do you do at a cocktail party? You can use it as your elevator pitch. If you have to introduce yourself on stage on a panel, you say that, people will hear you. When I'm at an event and I say, we help visionary entrepreneurs who can't turn it off, I can see seven or eight heads turn towards me and go, what did he just say? Because <laughs> they know that that's them. And so it is an incredibly effective framework. Oh, that's so good, I'm man. I love it. On day one, I think, or day two, day two. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm looking at it right now. Well, thank you so much, man. I uh, really appreciate you've been so generous with your time, diving into all kinds of different topics and uh, would absolutely encourage everybody listening to check out the podcast. And of course, go to MomentumMasterclass.com to check out Alex uh, uh, Masterclass. So thank you so much, Alex. This has been amazing. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure, Zach and Dylan. It was awesome being here with you. I don't know if your format lends it to it, but if, if maybe we can do a round two in a few months, if this goes over, Absolutely. Well. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'd love to come back and hang out with you guys. This was actually a lot of fun and I appreciate your, uh, your framework, the way that you put this together and, uh, and thank you both for having me. Thanks for coming on, man. so much for listening to another episode of the rich ad poor ad podcast if you're like me and listen to podcasts on the go go ahead and subscribe on apple podcasts spotify youtube and rich slash podcast and if you absolutely love the show go ahead and leave a review and a comment share with a friend if you do take a copy screenshot of it email me zach at funnel dash.com show me you left a review and i'll give you a free copy of the rich ad poor ad book to learn more about the book go to rich ad poor ad.com to leave a review, go to richadpored.com slash review. Thanks again.